and we're certainly very excited to participate. Um, <clears throat> I'd like to tell you about the groundbreaking technology that Humasite has been developing uh, over the last several years and talk to you about our recent clinical applications and progress that we're very excited about. <clears throat> So um, Humasite is a, is a first in a generation company where we are developing really groundbreaking strategies to engineer and produce human replacement tissues at commercial scale. Uh, these tissues are grown and engineered so that they can be implantable into any human recipient without any fear of rejection. Uh, we're very excited about this technology because we've seen it be applicable uh, and useful in many disease states already uh, in our clinical trials. Humicide as a company is committed to being the, the first company to, to bring our regenerative medicine products to the marketplace that will improve and extend the lives of patients worldwide and we think will transform the practice of medicine. If you look at the company at a glance, um, th there's really some high level key takeaways uh, that we'd like to communicate with you. First is that we believe we have category defining innovation. Uh, our, our method for producing tissues is unique in this space. Uh, we're the only company uh, in the world who is doing this type of automated uh, tissue production uh, at commercial scale. We also have a large body of clinical data already. We've treated more than 400 patients and we have over 800 patient years of exposure with a tremendous amount of information about how our products perform in the clinic. Humicite was also the first to receive the, re the Regenerative Medicine Advanced Therapy designation by the FDA in 2017. We were also very proud to be named in 2018 by the Defense Department as one of their key priority uh, product designations. And in fact, the Defense Department and the FDA have partnered well with Humicite to help devise clinical trials and speed our path to approval. We're very well capitalized. We've raised over $440 million um, and our investor base is, uh, is highly committed uh, to Humicite's vision and to our progress. We also have an extensive product pipeline. We have two products that are, that are near term and that we, we hope to file BLAs for in, in either later this year or in 2022. But in addition, we have a host of longer term products in vascular and even non-vascular applications that we think will really drive the long-term value of our company. <clears throat> Going along with that, we have a significant commercial potential for Humicite. Um, we estimate that we, our peak sales in the United States could reach $7 billion with the items that are in our near and intermediate term pipeline right now. In addition, we have a strong partnership with Fresenius, which is one of the global leaders in dialysis care. One of our initial product indications is in, in use of our engineered vessel as a dialysis access conduit. And so partnering with Fresenius um, and the strength of their investment and commitment to Humicite really, really signals for us that, that we, we will have uh, an excellent partner as we go forward to commercialize our early products. In addition, we have strong IP protection. Uh, we have intellectual property that we've then licensed from universities and also a very strong pro portfolio that we've developed in-house. And in fact, our IP uh, issued patent protection extends on our composition of matter throughout 2032. If we think about the potential areas where Humicite's platform technology may have clinical impact, there's really a large array. <clears throat> First and foremost, we have phase three trials underway in dialysis access um, or arteriovenous access, as you can see on the left-hand side of this slide. We also have phase three trial underway in using our engineered vessel for the repair of vascular trauma. Uh, so this is gunshot wounds, car accidents, industrial accidents, et cetera. And it's this trauma indication that really has, has allowed us to partner with the Defense Department and uh, work to move our HAV forward to the clinic even more quickly to treat uh, 
both injured civilians, but also injured warfighters. In addition, we have phase two trials that, that are underway and completed um, in the, the use of our HAV for peripheral arterial disease. But going beyond this, um, we have uh, large animal studies that are ongoing even as we speak in the use of, of smaller versions of our vessels for coronary artery bypass and also for pediatric cardiac surgery. Uh, we're actively exploring the use of our engineered tissues and their ability to help cure and correct cardiac defects that, that some babies are born with. We're also going to determine whether, whether our vessels can grow uh, with the recipient and, and hence could be a huge boon for, for pediatric cardiac surgery and multiple types of reconstructive surgery in children. Because as we all know, there's nothing right now, there's no implant right now that will grow with a child. Um, so we're very excited about these near and intermediate term pipeline opportunities, but we also have a non-vascular applications that we're very excited about. We have primate data on using a variant of our engineered uh, vessel that is stented in order to replace the airway and, and to serve as long-term airway functional replacement. We also have data on esophageal replacement and also urinary conduit and urinary diversion uh, implants. Very excitingly, we've been recently working on combining our engineered vessel with uh, pancreatic islets and essentially using our vessel as a delivery vehicle to deliver large therapeutic numbers of pancreatic islets to patients with type 1 diabetes. In the long term, this may be uh, therapeutic or even curative for patients with that terrible disease. I'd like to show you a short video of our manufacturing process and how we make these engineered tissues uh, at scale uh, in our facility. Our technology platform isolates and grows human acellular vessels, or HAVs, that can be stored on a shelf in a hospital, ready and waiting for patients who need them. Here's how the humicide process works. Donated human smooth muscle cells are placed on a tubular scaffold to form a vessel. The tissue cells grow in vitro to form a biological 3D scaffold matrix. Cells on the scaffold generate vessel tissue during culture in a bioreactor system. For eight weeks, the vessels are grown and monitored under conditions of constant flow and pressure. The vessel tissue is then cleansed of qualities that might trigger an immune response. And we're left with our HAV. So this, uh, this is a single image that essentially summarizes the short video that I just showed you. Essentially, our process begins with vascular smooth muscle cells that are isolated from human tissue. It's important to note that Humocyte has been collecting and banking high quality vascular smooth muscle cells for a number of years. And in fact, we have in our cryo storage sufficient cells to support our commercial manufacturing for the next 10 to 20 years. Uh, so from this really robust cell bank, we, we will extract a single frozen vial of cells. We'll thaw that vial and expand those cells uh, in vitro. And then we'll seed the cells into bioreactors, which contain the degradable polymer scaffold. Cells will attach to the scaffold. And then in the presence of culture medium, the cells grow and they secrete extracellular matrix. While that's going, going on, the polymer scaffold itself is degrading over time. As a final step, at the end of culture, we drain the culture medium out of the bioreactors and instead uh, replace that with decellularization solutions. In this several day process, what that does is it removes the cellular components from the tissue and allows the tissue to uh, retain its mechanical properties while being cleansed of any properties or components that might trigger an immune response. Because the, because the cells are washed away and the tissue is non-living, these vessels also have a shelf life. Our current shelf life for our product is 18 months. So our manufacturing process has been, has been developed uh, to be at truly commercial scale. Uh, in our current facility in uh, Durham, North Carolina, which is an 83,000 square foot building, we currently have 
have installed a total of eight uh, units that we call the Luna 200 units. Each of these units can generate 1,000 vessels per year. And we have eight installed currently, although we have floor space in our facility to install a total of 40 of these units, which means that in this current facility, our manufacturing capacity could reach 40,000 vessels per year. Um, this process uh, utilizes at, at its core an individual polymer scaffold and vessel that's contained within a single bioreactor bag, which is shown on the left. Ten of these bioreactor bags are yoked together in what we call a growth drawer, and then 20 of those drawers are yoked together and connected to a single culture medium tank that supplies the same medium and nutrients to all 200 vessels as they're growing. This system uh, has been designed by Humasites engineers and is proprietary uh, and also is highly automated. So the amount of manpower that it takes to generate a, a batch of 200 vessels is actually mi quite minimal. So here's a summary of our ongoing clinical trials and, and preclinical efforts. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, we have phase three trials underway in vascular coma and also in arteriovenous access for patients who are on hemodialysis. In addition, we have uh, two phase two trials that are completed uh, in patients who have peripheral arterial disease and have received the HAV to revascularize their limbs, which were otherwise ischemic, painful, and potentially facing amputation. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we also have active uh, primate programs underway in pediat pediatric cardiac surgery and adult cardiac surgery. And in addition, we're planning on initiating a primate study in our product to treat type 1 diabetes uh, in the coming year. So here's an example uh, and a case study from one of our phase 3 trials. This is from our trauma trial, which we could, would dub our VO5 trial. Uh, on the right, you'll see a photo of a man who suffered a gunshot wound to the left upper chest. Uh, the path of the bullet actually disrupted the artery that supplied his left arm. And so shortly after the injury, he lost all feeling and motion in his left arm and the arm was paralyzed. Uh, physicians at the hospital attempted to repair the, the damaged artery using a, a stenting technique, but that attempt failed. And so he was taken to the operating room to try to repair his damaged artery. Now the surgeons could have harvested vein from his leg and then taken that vein and put it up into his chest to replace his artery. Um, however, that would have added an additional hour of time uh, before, before his arm was reperfused. And so this patient was enrolled in this trial to allow him to receive the HAV and to revascularize his arm uh, in, a more, in a more speedy fashion. Um, we know from clinical studies that the longer you wait to reperfuse an injured limb in this, in this way, the higher the risks are of permanent limb damage and also amputation. Uh, so this patient has gone on to do very well. Um, at, at the time of his last visit, his, his circulation and his arm function are completely normal. But this brings us to some of the issues that really drive potential clinical adoption of the HAV in vascular trauma. Uh, so as we know, harvesting vein from the leg to, to use to revascularize an injured patient takes time. And uh, that can delay revascularization and can lead to even more complications. In addition, using a synthetic product like something made of PTFE or Teflon, uh, if those grafts are taken off the shelf and used to revascularize patients, uh, they work in the short term, but, but they can be at very high risk of infection and if these grafts become infected, then the rate of limb amputation and even patient death becomes quite high. So this is a situation where patients with, with acute arterial injury often lack good alternatives. And surgeons caring for these patients, we believe will be very motivated to use a, a excellently functioning product that they could pull off the shelf that had low rates of infection and also very high durability. So we've designed a clinical trial to study the function of the HAV in acute vascular trauma. That, this trial is underway um, in 
uh, more than a dozen sites in the U.S. right now. These are all major level one trauma centers. Uh, the design of the trial is a, a bit unique in that it's a single arm trial. Uh, and our comparator in this trial is historical control. Uh, we have no active comparator. So this is a single arm trial. And because of that, uh, we are not blinded in this study. Uh, we've been able to follow outcomes of patients in this pivotal trial. And we're seeing that the outcomes uh, in terms of graft patency and limb, limb salvage in these subjects has been excellent. In fact, our 30 day patency for our 27 evaluable subjects has been 100%. In addition, we have seen no instances of HAV infection in any of these trauma victims, despite the fact that many of their wounds are actually fairly contaminated. So our early results are very encouraging. Uh, we're still um, in, in the final stages of designing this trial in collaboration with the FDA, uh, but we hope to complete enrollment of this trial later in 2021. What makes the, the trauma market particularly attractive to Humicite is the fact that th this is actually a fairly concentrated market, though it's an important market and a fairly large market with an estimated 70,000 patients per year in the U.S. needing vascular repair of some kind. Uh, most of these repairs are actually concentrated in approximately 190 level one trauma centers in the U.S. Uh, what this means is that Humicite will be able to field a reasonably sized sale force, sales force, perhaps 15 to 20 uh, sales representatives that will allow us to interact with, with surgeons and key opinion leaders at these sites and also work with, work, work with hospital committees to uh, bring this product onto the formulary. So we're very excited about moving forward with this application. Uh, and we're also very excited to eventually see the HAV used to be treat, used to treat civilian injuries, but also injuries of, of wounded warfighters um, in, in the military. Our second phase three program has to do with dialysis access. So end stage renal disease is, a, is an important and growing problem in the United States. There's nearly half a million patients who are currently on hemodialysis because their kidneys have permanently failed. Uh, and that number is growing by three to 5% every year. Uh, similar to the trauma population, dialysis patients have few really good options for uh, developing access for hemodialysis. In order to undergo dialysis, a patient with kidney failure needs a vessel that sits underneath their skin and can be accessed uh, with two needles to draw blood out of the patient and take it to the dialysis machine and then return it to the patient. Such conduits don't naturally exist in our body. And so it's necessary either to sew an artery and a vein together, which is called a fistula, or to take a piece of plastic like Teflon and to sew that between an artery and a vein in the arm. Neither of these options is, is perfect. Uh, if you look at fistula operations, an estimated 40% of these operations fail because the vein that, that the surgeon sews to never becomes sufficiently dilated to, to allow enough blood flow for dialysis. Uh, in contrast, uh, using synthetic vessels like those made out of Teflon, uh, they can allow high blood flow at early time points, but they have earlier failure rates. They have sh low durability and they also tend to become infected. In fact, they become infected about 10 times more often than, um, than fistulas do, than native tissue. So many dialysis patients are, are stuck in a situation where they're unable to have their fistula mature and or they have frequent infections due to their synthetic uh, vascular conduits. So we believe that the HAV may represent a superior solution for many of these dialysis patients. In fact, a, a one case study of one of our early patients uh, is shown on the right. This is a man who suffered multiple debilitating infections from his dialysis access over a period of years. Um, he then received the HAV and you can see it's implanted underneath his skin in the upper photo on the right hand side of the slide. The lower photo on the right hand side shows the same patient's arm about a year and a half after he had his implant you may be able to appreciate that there are many needle puncture marks over the surface of the skin 
where this patient has had the, the graft punctured in order to undergo dialysis. So this patient's graft worked, uh, worked very well for him for a period of four years and really improved his quality of life and decreased his hospitalization uh, because he was having uh, no infections and, and was overall doing very well. So in light of this anticipated uh, profile, um, we're anticipating uh, com um, completing our phase three evaluations of the HAV in dialysis during this year. And we intend to file a BLA next year um, on this uh, indication. But to provide you a little bit of clinical data on how well the HAV performs in dialysis, we have some patients that have been using our vessels for dialysis for periods of six and seven years or longer. Um, and you can see on the lower left of this slide, you can see data showing the longevity of the HAV in dialysis from our phase two studies. A recent analysis of five-year results in our earliest patients shows that the functional patency of the HAV at five years is 58%. That compares very well with what we see with fistula and with PTFE, which are both at around 30% or lower. Um, looking at our phase three data, we can see that they're generally tracking with this phase two data. And we would expect that the secondary patency of the HAV at five years will be 50% or greater in our phase three trials. Uh, which is very encouraging because that shows just the durability and the uh, and the strength of this material and its ability to withstand repeated needle punctures over weeks and months and years. In addition, as I mentioned earlier, the, we've shown that the HAV uh, really significantly resists infection. Uh, in fact, data from one of our phase three trials, which is shown on the lower right, shows you that there's a significantly decreased rate of infection in the HAV grafts in dialysis as compared to PTFE. In fact, the PTFE infection rate is five times that of the HAV in our phase three trial. So the, the profile of the HAV in dialysis is, is really appearing to be one of uh, high, very high usability, greater than 90% usability at six months, uh, very good durability, and also extremely low infection rate. So as I, men as I mentioned, that there's um, nearly 500,000 patients uh, who require dialysis access um, in the US. Uh, as I also mentioned earlier, we've partnered with Fresenius, which is one of the world leaders in, both in, in providing dialysis service to patients but, but also uh, a national leader in the development of outpatient surgical centers, which perform dialysis access and other vascular types of procedures. So we're very excited uh, to have had the endorsement from Presenius uh, when they made $150 million investment in 2018. And we're very excited to continue our partnership with them um, as they've pledged to work with us to help us to commercialize and market our, our products for in the dialysis access space in the US, but also internationally. So I'd like to talk just a little bit about our longer term pipeline. Um, as I mentioned, uh, the, the platform for, for producing human tissues allows us to produce them at scale, uh, but also allows us to produce tissues of different sizes and dimensions. So we can make them longer, fatter, shorter, smaller, we can also combine these tissues either with stents, which, which provide them with, with different mechanical characteristics and a different profile, or we can combine these tissues with cells that may be therapeutic, for example, pancreatic islets. Um, one thing that I would like to show you is our recent work in coronary artery bypass. Uh, obviously, coronary artery bypass grafting or cabbage is a, is a frequently performed procedure in the United States. Uh, there's at least 200,000 of these operations done every year in the US. And if you add that onto Europe, that's about half a million procedures per year. In most cases, saphenous vein is stripped from the leg in order to provide a bypass vessel for the heart. However, many patients, particularly those who are obese or diabetic, suffer serious complications from this vein stripping process, including persistent numbness, persistent infection, failure to heal, 
uh, persistent swelling. Um, this, these problems are worse in women and they're worse in, in diabetics and in, the, and in the overweight population. So there are many patients and also many surgeons who would welcome the, the possibility of being able to use a conduit to, to bypass clogged arteries in the heart that they did not have to take out of the patient's leg. Um, as you can see in the lower left-hand corner of this slide, a uh, humocyte can produce engineered vessels at a range of diameters. Uh, our, our engineered vessels for uh, dialysis access and trauma are currently at six millimeters, but we're also engineering three and a half and four millimeter vessels for use in pediatric cardiac surgery, as well as coronary bypass. The, the film here shows a coronary bypass of, of using, an, using one of humocytes HAVs. You can see sort of a blue, uh, bluish tube uh, in this image and I can click it and, and you can see the heart beating, I hope, there we go. So the vigorous heartbeat here shows that the blood flow through the HAV conduit is actually very robust and it's supplying excellent blood and oxygen to the heart muscle. Uh, so this is a pig implant, uh, but as I mentioned, we have primate implants that are currently underway and we hope will serve as the basis for an IND filing to the FDA in order to proceed with a phase one trial in coronary artery bypass in patients. So just to overview our commercialization plan, um, as I mentioned earlier, we anticipate fielding a, a, a direct sales force for our first indication, which will be in vascular trauma. Again, this is a finite number of call points with only 190 um, level one trauma centers in the US. So we anticipate that that is something that Humocyte <clears throat> will generate um, under, under its own uh, power. And uh, we will uh, combine our, our sales and marketing efforts with health economics and reimbursement efforts uh, to have a successful product launch, we believe starting in late 2022. In addition, um, in, in 2022, we plan to file a BLA in the dialysis access application. In that marketing effort, we will partner closely with Fresenius, um, who obviously has a significant footprint in the dialysis access space and who can help us position the product um, in terms of adoption and terms of uh, key, key opinion leader, um, uh, involvement, and also in terms of reimbursement strategies. Going further, as we develop the rest of our pipeline in adult and pediatric cardiac surgery and other applications, it's possible that we may also strategically partner some of these applications down the road, uh, potentially with pharma or medical device companies. Um, and we remain open to a variety of different strategic uh, partnerships and interactions. So looking at the total commercial potential of our pipeline, our near-term products uh, in vascular trauma and AV access will generate, we, we believe at peak, about $1.3 billion in revenue. And this is in the US alone. Uh, Follow-on indications in peripheral arterial disease and also in coronary bypass and in the treatment of diabetes, uh, we believe could bring US revenues up to the $7 billion range. And again, this is not, not this is not an international number. This is U.S. Uh, only revenues. So we're very excited about the about the near term and intermediate term commercial potential of our technology pipeline. So we've got a great board and we've got a great leadership team. Um, it's taken a number of years to to ge to generate this uh, really paradigm shifting uh, scientific uh, platform. It's taken time, it's taken money, it's taken, uh, it's taken a lot of in vitro and animal work and a lot of human studies. Again, we've been in man for eight years and, uh, and we've been uh, in the current facility where we are for three or four years um, and have really successfully scaled out our manufacturing process. So we really feel that we're, we're very poised to be successful uh, in the near term in 2021 and 2022 but it's really all due to our incredibly uh, devoted and, and enthusiastic team, both at the leadership and management level and also at the board level. Um, I'd like to finish with what I think will be a couple of milestones in 2021. Um, we're very excited to be presenting at this conference. We presented at JP Morgan uh, a few days ago, so that was also very exciting. 
Uh, we anticipate uh, publishing some long-term clinical results uh, in coming months. We anticipate publishing uh, our five-year experience in dialysis uh, in a few months, uh, as well as our um, six-year experience in peripheral arterial disease, uh, which is a publication that we're pulling together right now. Uh, in addition, we expect to, to report in the scientific literature our progress in, in um, primate coronary artery uh, grafting, as well as pediatric cardiac surgery, both in primates. Uh, we're very excited to be able to tell those preclinical stories, and we think we'll tell those next, this coming year. In addition, we expect to complete enrollment of our, of our phase three trials, both in dialysis access and in trauma. Uh, and we expect that this will support BLA filings either late in 2021 or, or early to mid-2022. Um, in addition, we'll continue to engage with thought leaders at various national and international meetings in trauma and dialysis access, but also more broadly in vascular surgery. So I think that's really all I had. Um, I really appreciate the opportunity to be able to present today. And Mike, I'd like to hand it back to you to see if you have any questions. Thanks, Laura. I think we have a couple questions, but I think we've run to the end of our session time. So just like to thank you for uh, participating today and